Pastor John here, inviting you to join my wife Denise and myself as we plunge into the depths of God's Word, growing ever closer to Him. I pray that He gives us all eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. Now join us in our service already in progress. God bless you. Hallelujah! Welcome back to the channel. God bless you. So good to be here today. Open with me in your Bibles to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 7 and 8. I have this chapter, I mean this chapter, I have these two verses memorized, but I will read them. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Father in heaven, I humble myself before you, Lord. I cannot do this without you. I will not do this without you. I must not do this without you, Holy Spirit. I ask you to breathe life upon this word. Anoint these lips of clay that I might speak your words and your words alone. Give us all eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A few months ago, last year, sometime, I don't know, my wife did a series titled, what was it titled? The Unspeakable Power of God. The title of my message today is The Unsearchable Love of God. The Unsearchable Love of God. There are seven facts that I want you to know about love this morning. Number one, God is love, as we just read. From Genesis to Revelation, now I want you to take note of this. The word love <coughs> is used 310 times. The word loved is used 98 times. The word lovest, lovest is used twice. Loves thrice. Lovest twelve times. And loveth sixty-five times. For a grand total of four hundred and ninety times. And that's not including the words like lover and lovers and lovely and even loves possessively. Now, when you see a word that appears this many times in the Bible, number one, you can guarantee you, you can put a theme together. That this is a book of love. But, any time you see a word that, that's that many times in the Bible, you need to pay attention to it. You need to dig into it. And you need to find out what it's all about. Number two. Love will put up with the worst. All of our mothers. How many of you here have mothers that you love? How many of you here have mothers that love you? I know there are some people who don't have great relationships with their mothers. There may be some mothers out there that don't care about their children. But they are not the rule or the exception. They are very rare. How many of you have ever say, heard somebody say that boy or that girl's got a face that only a mother could love? Because a mother will love you no matter what. I do, uh, I do prison ministries. Um, 
I don't go into the prisons anymore. I write to the prisoners. I speak to them on the phone. But every, not almost every one of them, no matter what they're in prison for, their mothers love them. That's still their baby. They still care about them. They don't write them off. Well, no matter what heinous crime they may have done, the mothers still love them. Now, Yeah, the mothers don't forsake us. First Corinthians, First Corinthians. I just made up a book in the Bible. It's uh, it's going to be on a test later. First Corinthians, thirteen, four, says charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up, and the word used here for charity is agape. Agape is the God kind of love. Agape means love that is affection, benevolence, specifically a love feast. And it is, like I said, the God kind of love. It is unconditional. No matter what you've done, God loves you. Number three, and that goes right to what I just said, Love is not earned. It is a gift. I'm sure many of us get gifts at Christmas or birthdays. What did you do to earn those gifts? Nothing. Do people take that gift away from you? No. A gift is a gift. It's given. It's a gift. They don't come back and say, I want that back. Love is not earned. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When somebody gives you a gift, it's not based on anything that you've done. Number four, fact that you that I want you to know. You must know it. Number four is love, which we already touched on, is unconditional. Sometimes I do things, bless you, sometimes I do things that upset my wife. She's not happy with me. She may be angry with me. But you know what? She still loves me. I'm so thankful for her. And sometimes she does things that don't make me happy. Believe it or not. I know she's wonderful. She's sweet. She's kind. But she can be a handful herself sometimes. But I love her anyway. And I thank God for that woman. Every day I wake up and I thank God for my wife. God bless you, sweetheart. Um... And I'm going to refer back to Romans 5.8 on that. He loved us when we were unlovable. You know, what did Paul say about, about uh, love? He said, for, you know, most people won't die for somebody else. Maybe for a righteous man, somebody might die. But he died for us when we were still in our sin. He died for us when we were at our worst. Jesus looked through time and eternity. I cannot say this enough times. He looked through time and eternity. And He's seen us even at our worst. He saw you with that needle hanging out of your arm. He saw you when you were turning tricks on the street. He saw you when you were passed out drunk with a mouthful of vomit in the gutter. He saw you when you were beating somebody to death. He saw you when you raped someone. He saw you when you committed all sorts of foul, vile things. And He said, Father, that one is worth my blood. That one is worth me dying for. 
I will go for that one. Ted Bundy. Now I'm going to tell you a little story here. Ted Bundy was a serial killer. Everybody, I'm sure, that's watching this knows who he was. He used to go into prison with a man named Jack Murphy. He was affectionately known as Murph the Surf. In fact, there's a movie, if you can find it, titled Murph the Surf. that tells about his little criminal days where he was out breaking into museums and stealing gems and whatnot. And he wrote a book titled Jewels for the Journey. He was in prison for life for a murder that took place in Miami while he was in a robbery. And in the 80s, he got paroled. And I worked with the gentleman who was old enough that he read about all of Jack's exploits in the newspaper. And what had happened? Now I, I'm going to tell you the I'm going to tell you the rest of the story now. But Jack Murphy got in in prison and he got saved to the bone. God completely made him a new creation. And the prison around him, because he was so full of God, the prison around him. He was in the, one of the worst prisons in the state of Florida, Rayford, the highest crime level in that prison. And it became one of the safest prisons in Florida. And they said, what, what is the cause of this? And they started looking and they, they said, one of our worst prisoners. And they said, well, let's move him over here. And they moved him to another prison that was really, really bad. And the prison changed around him. And they said, well, let's see. We're, we're, we're starting to see a pattern. Let's move him. <laughs> so they, everywhere they moved Jack Murphy to, the crime rate. The shankings, the murders, all of it came down. And he became an evangelist inside of the Florida State prison system. And in the 80s, he was paroled. And I remember my friend who lived up north when all this was going on. He goes, oh, I remember when he was doing all this. This guy's just using God to get out of prison. He's going to, as soon as he gets out, he'll be back doing the same thing. Well, guess what? No. He never returned to crime. And he went around the state, devoted the remainder of his life to going into prisons and preaching the gospel. I went to a half a dozen or more, maybe, maybe eight or ten prisons visits with Jack Murphy. And the man was on fire for God. Well, the same person, when... Ted Bundy, oh, actually, no, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. The same person, when he was telling me about Jack Murphy, I said, Pete, God can save anybody. And he says to me, well, what about Ted Bundy? And I'm like, that was a tough one to, to say. And I said, yes, Pete, even Ted Bundy. And he didn't want to hear it because... You know, we all know Ted Bundy was a serial killer. In 2000, I was, uh, maybe 2001, but I was in, going into a prison with Jack Murphy in uh, Pasco or Hernando, I think it was Hernando County. And we were, <clears throat> we were sitting outside of the Sally Port waiting for them to get their act together and bring us in. And... I was sitting there alone with Jack and I thought I would share this story with him because on the night that Ted Bundy was electrocuted, he was interviewed by Dr. James Dobson and professed a beautiful profession of Christ. And as soon as I told him, my friend said, what about Ted Bundy? I didn't even get a chance to tell Jack the rest of the story. And I'm going to have to do my Jack Murphy impression. If anybody of you out here watching knows Ted, uh, Jack Murphy, you would know. But he said, Ted Bundy! Ted Bundy! Let me tell you something about Ted Bundy! Ted Bundy was a stand-up Christian. He was a real deal. Because I know him. Because I did time with him. Because for a time, Jack Murphy actually was on death row. And I was like, I felt so good to hear that. 
somebody that knew the man. You know, when we go to heaven, there we're going to be looking for people that didn't go there. And then we're going to see other people that we're going to be, what? How did this person get here? <laughs> Glory to God. Because love is not earned. It is a gift. And I can't wait to one day see Jack Murphy up there. Jack Murphy has gone on to be with the Lord. I had, uh, a couple of years ago, wanted to reach out to him. I hadn't heard anything from him in years. And one of my friends in the prison system told me that he'd gone on to be with the Lord a couple of years earlier. So, And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to that day. So love is unconditional. Number five. Jesus is the embodiment of love. I want you to think about that. God is love. Jesus is God. Why do I say that? 1 John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You skip down to the 14th verse. It says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of God. I will refer you again to Isaiah 9, verse 6, where it says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon His shoulders, and we shall call His name Wonderful, Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And I'm, I'm not going to give you another witness but those two. I have a bunch that I could give you. Well, a Jehovah Witness once told me, oh, it doesn't say in the Hebrew, it doesn't say the Mighty God. It says a Mighty God. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you, I studied it in the Hebrew, and it doesn't say either. It says His name will be Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. There was no the or a. Uh. So, stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Hallelujah. Jesus is the embodiment of love. God is love. Jesus, I want to give you one more. Philip said, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said, have you been so long with me, Philip, that you've not known he that has seen me has seen the Father? Because God is love. In John 15, 13, Jesus says this to the disciples, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Number six. <clears throat> love is the key that unlocks the other commandments. All of the commandments are unlocked with love. Matthew 22, 35. Then one of them which was a lawyer asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Because if I love my neighbor, I'm not going to take his wife away and sleep with her. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to steal his goods. I'm not going to hurt him. I'm not going to kill him. If I love God, I want to keep his commandments. Number seven. Love is not an option. It is a command. John 13, 34, Jesus says, this is a new commandment. A new commandment that you love one another. John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. How do I answer? How could a God of love dot, dot, dot? Because there are people out there that will say, well, if God's a God of love, then why are people born without limbs? Why are there Siamese twins? 
Why is there war in the world? Why are there murders? Why are there rapes? Why is all this evil here? I can sum it up in two words. Free will. <laughs> That's why. Does your mother love you? Now, I talked about this in the beginning. This could be a loaded question for some people. Most cases, the answer is yes. But how could she love you if you did X, Y, Z? Fill in the blank. You pick your sin. You pick the thing that nauseates you the most. And you say, how could your mother love you if you did that? How could she not? You are her baby. We are all God's babies. All of us. From saint to sinner. Every last one of us are God's children. And the Bible says that He is not willing that one should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. Well, you're a grown man. You make those choices on your own. Just like God gave choices to us Genesis 2.16 And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little secret here. I didn't look up the word today. I have looked it up in the past. I don't remember what the Hebrew word is for die. But it doesn't mean... Would like in English, if we say, if you jump off of that bridge, you're going to die, that means you're going to be instantly dead, right? Well, in the Hebrew, that word die, it means to be guilty of death and to deserve death. So it didn't mean he was going to instantly die. That's why he ate of it and didn't die physically right at that moment. He died spiritually. Now, let me ask you a question. Did God put a fence around the tree of knowledge of good and evil? No. He didn't try to keep man away from him. He just said, hey, don't eat of that tree. Now all these others, dozens and dozens and dozens of other trees that you can eat one from, but just that one tree over there, leave it alone. But, no. What did we do? Every one of us is guilty of it. Let's not put it all on Adam and Eve because every one of us have made our own choices and blown it. I will tell you a tree that he hedged in to keep man away from was the tree of, the, of life. Because after they sinned, God said, let's uh, put them out of the garden unless they put their hand to the tree of life and live forever. Um, how many times did your, your parents instruct you to do something when you were children? Don't smoke. Don't drink. How many of us kept that? Yes, very good. I didn't. <laughs> I smoked and I drank. I did a lot of bad things. But thank God for the blood of Jesus. I'm a new creation. <laughs> Now let me ask you this. If you didn't obey those things that your parents said to do and not to do, if you, if, if you did, if you smoked and you drank and you did all the things they told you not to, did that cancel out their love? That is how a God of love operates because He lets us choose for ourselves. John 3, 16, 17 and 18. We all know the 16th verse. Nobody ever reads the 17th and 18th verse. I'm going to quote it to you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We all cling to that one. That is the one that our salvation is based on. But then the 17th verse and the 18th verse say, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Because that is the action of a God of love. 
He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he was an alcoholic. He was a homosexual. He was a whoremonger. He was a bank robber. He was a murderer. No, it's not what it says. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Hallelujah. Jesus knew you and loved you before you were born. And I believe I quoted, not quoted, but I spoke about this a little earlier. Hebrews 12.12 12 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Again, before Jesus decided to go to that cross, He looked through time and eternity and He saw you, Michael. He saw you, David. And He said, yes, I will die for them. He saw, insert your name here, and He said, they're worth it. And I'm going to give you a little secret in life. You want to find out what your worth is in life? Don't base your worth on your salary. Don't base your worth on your good looks. Don't base your worth on how people praise you. If you want to find true worth and meaning in life, you look to that verse right there. Because Jesus saw you at your worst and said, I love him, I love her, I will die for that person. That's where your worth, that's where your value comes from. That's how you know that you're just not a worthless piece of garbage regardless of what some man or some woman has spoken into your life. God loves you so much that He gave up His throne in heaven and poured His blood out onto the ground and you want to say, how could a God of love give me a break? God loves you. I'm getting ready to close here. But I want to give you three miracles that are a direct result of love. Number one, Matthew 15.33 Then Jesus called His disciples unto Him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me three days and have nothing to eat and I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way he fed the 4,000 because he was compassionate towards them and I'm going to tell you something you can't have compassion without having love number two Matthew 20 34 so Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed Him. He didn't say, look at me, I'm the great Messiah. Watch me heal these people. No. He looked at that person with compassion. Never had their eyes open in their life. And He touched their eyes and opened them because of love. Number three, Luke 17, 12. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city were there, or were with her, I'm sorry. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion. She can't have another son. She's a widow. That was her only son. All right, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bear. And they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. 
And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. This is the key to the 13th chapter of Corinthians. Read it in context. Start in the last couple of verses of the 12th chapter and then read it through. And you will see that it is talking about this very thing right here. You want signs and wonders following your ministry? You want miracles following your ministry? Then have compassion on people. Don't do it so you can make a name for yourself. In fact, Jesus many times told them, don't go and tell anybody. But yet they went out and they made they blazed it abroad. All three of these miracles had one common theme, and that was compassion. The Greek word used for compassion here. Oh, I'm not, I, I think I told you a fib. I got another, I got another a couple of notes here. Um, the Greek used, word we used here for compassion all three times. Now this is a, ma- a mouthful, so forgive me if I have a hard time saying it. Splagchinosome. And it means to have your bowels yearn. To feel sympathy. To pity. To be moved with compassion. What can I do to see God move in His dunamis power? Folks, usually when I say I'm closing, I really am closing. But I'm closing this time. I've got three, three things here that you can do to see God move in His power. Number one, pray for people with and through compassion. 1 Corinthians 13.1, we just mentioned that. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And we could go on and read the whole thing, but we're not going to. Why? Why? If I don't have charity and I'm speaking in tongues, why am I just a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal? Because there is no love. Am I doing it just to be seen? Why am I doing it? What's your motivation? That's what you need to ask yourself. What is motivating you to do what you're doing? Number two, stop telling people that they're going to hell because... X, Y, Z, and search your favorite sin. Stop telling them that. Everybody is guilty of sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now I'm going to tell you a little secret. Deep inside every sinner, they already feel bad about their sin. That is why people don't want you coming to them and tell them about God. Because they're already guilty. They're already convicted. (laughs) They are. The Bible says that men love darkness because their deeds were evil and they hated the light and wouldn't come close to the light lest their deeds should be reproved. They already feel bad. But what many of them want to do is to get you to agree with them so they can feel better about their sins. LGBTQ community. Hello? They're not pushing for gay rights. They've got all the rights in the world that they need, they want. Nobody cares. You want to go run off and do whatever you want to do. It's not right, but it's your business. But I don't need to know everything about it. They don't want rights. They want me to agree with them that there's 19 or 20 different genders. They know that there's only two genders. If there are only, if there are 19 or 20 genders and, and whatnot, then why do they still call it gender reassignment surgery? Hello? <laughs> drunks feel bad. Most drunks don't want to be, you know, I mean, they, in the moment, yeah, they feel great. But the next morning, oh, I wish I could stop drinking. All my money is going to drinking. My drinking cost me my family. My drinking cost me my home. My drinking cost me my job. Now I'm out here on the street begging for money so I can get another drink. 
You think anybody wants to live like that? No. They're not going to hell because of that. They're going to hell because they don't have Jesus. I refer you back to John 3.17. God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. Stop condemning people. It's not your job. Your job is to preach the gospel. Tell them about Jesus. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict people of sin. That is why so many sinners don't want to have nothing to do with the church. Because they know that we're just going to come out and point out their sin. No, you need Jesus. That's what you need. That's it. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Number three, and I'm closing with this one. And I said it earlier. Check your motives. 1 Corinthians 13.2 And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have the faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Hey, if you're going to come to church and you're going to give $1,000 so God can give you a hundredfold return, and that's your motive, keep your thousand dollars because I promise you you're going to need it. Okay? Now, if you go to church with a thousand dollars and you say, I want to bless this ministry, I want to see this ministry grow, now you've got a motivation to give. Hallelujah. If you want to see love defined in action, you really want to see love defined, read the Gospel according to John. Folks, there is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. And I'm going to ask you this morning, every head bowed, well, hallelujah, there we go, every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here this morning or you're watching and you have never asked Jesus to be your Savior, today is your day. Maybe you have made that decision and you've fallen away. Today is your day too. I'm going to ask you to say a prayer with me this morning. Mean it in your heart. Father in heaven, I am a sinner. Be merciful to me, Lord. I know that my sin has separated me from you. I'm sorry for my sin, Lord. I know that it was my sin that nailed Jesus to that cross. That He died and raised from the dead three days later. That after 40 days of walking this earth after His resurrection, that He was taken up to heaven where He is seated at the right hand of God, waiting to come back for His church. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. That means I turn my back on them. And I turn to You, Lord. I ask You, Lord Jesus, to forgive me for my sins. Save me, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And be my soon coming King. I confess You now as my Savior, Lord. I ask all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Friends, if you said that prayer with me this morning and really meant it in your heart, God bless you and welcome to the family. I've got a brand new brother or a sister. Hallelujah. Jesus loves you. We love you. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, take a minute and hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. The notifications bell so you get all of our messages. Until next time, God bless you. We love you and we'll see you real soon. Hallelujah.